in Kingman, Arizona in the spring of 1953 is potentially one of the most controversial UFO crash cases in history. In most of these cases, despite the obvious caution, such claims usually fall into one category or another. With the Kingman event, compelling arguments are made for both it being a genuine event or something explained with more down-to-earth reasons. The Kingman UFO crash has been debated for decades, and as things stand right now, looks set to continue to be so for decades to come. Even though the events occurred three quarters of a century ago, in the first years of the modern UFO era, this is the story of the Kingman UFO crash. This is Somewhere in the Skies with Ryan Sprague. According to a chapter written in the book Exposed, Uncovered, and Declassified by author and researcher Nick Redfern, the origins of the apparent UFO crash at Kingman, Arizona can be traced back to 1971. Redfern relays that two young UFO investigators, Jeff Young and Paul Chetham, were investigating reports of the alleged crash, which included not only the recovery of the craft, but an extraterrestrial body as well. Redfern would relate that the pair obtained much of their information via a friend of the Young family, Arthur Stansel, who further claimed that he himself had first-hand knowledge of the incident. Stansel, for the most part, and at least on the surface, appeared to be credible and reliable. He was a veteran of the Second World War, who had taken part in the D-Day landings, and had since obtained a master's degree in engineering. But of more interest to the investigators, at the time of the incident in early 1953, Stansel was walking at the quote, ultra-secret Nevada probing ground, where many atomic bombs were being tested, particularly between the spring and summer of that year, as part of Operation Upshot Knothole. On the evening of May 21st, 1953, Stanzo would be witness to something a little different from nuclear weapons tests. And even more interesting, the incident, according to Stanzo, was investigated by none other than the U.S. Air Force's Project Blue Book. But even more interesting, Stanzo was indeed working for Project Blue Book at the time. On the night in question, the base commander at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio made an out-of-the-blue phone call to Stansel. He would order him to make his way to Phoenix, Arizona, where he would be picked up by a waiting military vehicle and taken to the location of a recently crashed vehicle several miles outside Kingman. A vehicle, he was told, was a top-secret military project. When he arrived there, however, he felt the downed craft, or what was left of it, was not of any design he had ever previously seen. He recalled that it was a cross between a teardrop and a cigar, and was approximately 12 feet long. Further details were offered years later, in 2016, by another UFO investigator and past contributing writer for the podcast, Preston Dennett who claimed that the object was metallic, 30 feet wide, and three and a half feet high, as well as being oval-shaped with portholes. More astonishing, inside the crippled object were the remains of a humanoid occupant, although they were certainly not human. According to Stansel, this humanoid figure was around four feet tall with dark skin and facial features that were unlike any human being. Once again, 
we should highlight the comments of the previously mentioned Preston Dennett, who claimed there were quote, two to four four foot tall humanoids inside the craft, all of which were dead and wore metallic suits and had large dark eyes. From there, as Redfern further relays in his book, the investigation grew cold. An article did appear, though, in the April 23rd, 1973 edition of the Middlesex News. An article that caught the attention of UFO investigator Raymond Fowler. Intrigued by the claims, Fowler himself began investigating the alleged crash. In a bizarre twist, Fowler would eventually discover that Stansel was employed by the same company he himself had worked for and contacting him was decidedly simple. On the afternoon of May 4th, 1973, almost 20 years to the day that the apparent incident occurred, Fowler walked into Stansel's office in order to speak to the witness further of what he knew of the controversial claims of downed alien craft and extraterrestrial occupants. And it was here where the tale began to take a series of twists. Stanzo began to tell his account to Fowler. However, it was immediately apparent that there were several distinct differences between this version of events and the one he had recalled to Young and Chatham. Fowler confronted Stanzo with this, to which he responded that he was simply the worst for several martinis at the time he had first told of the incident. Still, at least a little suspicious, Fowler continued with his investigation, based very much on the details that Stancil had offered. Stancil had stated to Fowler that upon arriving in Phoenix that May afternoon, he was placed on a bus with blacked out windows and driven to the location in question. As opposed to what he had told the two young UFO investigators in 1971, this version of events now matched one that was put forward by Preston Dennett. Stanzel elaborated that when the investigative team looked inside the object, they could see a cabin that was oval-shaped and contained several technical screens and advanced devices, as well as two swivel-type chairs. Despite being told that the vehicle was a top-secret military craft, he stressed that everything about it was unlike anything he'd ever seen before, and he had sincere doubts that the object was made on Earth. According to the research of Preston Dennett, the craft and the occupant was quickly moved to a discreet military facility, either Area 51 in Nevada or to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio. Further studies of the craft, according to the information volunteered by Stansel, the craft likely struck the ground at around 1,200 miles per hour. Despite this, though, it was only damaged in a very minor way. Fowler would discover that Stansel had indeed worked in a variety of positions at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base between 1949 and 1960. And again, many of these departments and programs would have indeed dealt with recovered military vehicles, at least officially. Despite the discrepancies and the admittance of having been drinking at one point while relaying all this, Fowler did believe Stansel to be a credible witness. And when other witnesses began to approach Fowler over the coming years with their accounts, that Stansel's overall version of events appeared to be corroborated. Several years later, beginning in the late 1970s, UFO researcher and investigator Leonard Stringfield began writing and speaking of the case. The first of these was at the annual Mutual UFO Network Symposium in 1978. At the symposium, Stringfield told of an account that he had been told by a fellow UFO researcher, Charles Wilhelm, who had in turn been told of the account from his father that involved a one Major Daly who claimed that he had been taken to the site of a UFO crash sometime around April 1953, only a month out from the date offered by Stansel of May 1953. Further resonating with Stansel's account, the location was somewhere in the desert, and Daly had arrived there after being placed on a bus and blindfolded. Daly would describe the downed craft as being largely undamaged, of a metallic material and around 30 feet across. 
Leonard Stringfield would reveal further details of his investigation into the account two years later in 1980. According to his account, during the summer of 1977, he was approached by a pilot following a UFO lecture in Cincinnati, Ohio. The pilot claimed that he had been present at a UFO crash site in Arizona at some point in early 1953, a site somewhere in the desert. What's more, there were several alien bodies recovered from the craft and taken to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. The description of these alien bodies was remarkably similar to what was offered by Stansel, in that they were humanoid, but with distinct differences. Not least the large eyes and the fact that they were only around four feet tall. This anonymous pilot further offered that one of these aliens was actually alive when the team arrived, but that it had died shortly after. Stringfield, now more convinced than ever of the possibility of this account, at least the basic details of it, would continue investigating it and taking in new information as the years went by, and by the mid-1990s had further information to reveal. It was in February 1994 when Stringfield next revealed new significant information regarding the alleged UFO crash at Kingman. According to Stringfield, a source he identified only as, quote, JLD had approached him. What's more, he had knowledge of not just one UFO crash in Arizona in 1953, but two of them. However, in a further disappointing twist, Stringfield died a short time later. The identity of JLD remained a complete mystery. Several years later, though, another UFO investigator would step forward with apparent new information. Following the death of Stringfield, UFO investigator Don Schmidt would come forward following information he had received on the alleged UFO crash at Kingman from a woman by the name of Judy Woolcott. According to what she told Schmidt, in 1965, she received a letter from her husband, who at the time was serving in Vietnam and to say that the letter concerned her would be an understatement. In the letter, her husband told her of a bizarre event he had witnessed 12 years previously, in 1953. The location of this apparent event? Kingman, Arizona. Judy would state that her husband, who was a military officer at the time, and who also happened to be on duty on the night in question, claimed that an unidentified object had been picked up by the military radar. It had appeared out of nowhere and appeared to be losing altitude at a rapid rate. Then it simply disappeared from the screen. According to her husband, something otherworldly had crashed somewhere in the desert near Kingman. And even more intriguing, several alien occupants had been recovered from the wreckage. Even more concerning to Judy though, was the intense feeling that her husband wouldn't make it home from Vietnam alive. Whether it was connected to the information he had relayed to his wife in the letter, Judy confirmed that her husband did indeed die in Vietnam. The story, though, would take on further twists and turns into the opening decades of the 21st century over half a century after the alleged UFO came crashing to the ground in May of 1953. Judy's claims stood for around a decade. However, in 2010, researcher Kevin Randall re-examined the case, including the testimony of one Judy Wolcott, who unfortunately at the time had passed away. Ultimately, Randall found ample evidence to treat Judy's version of events with suspicion, to say the very least. As relayed by Nick Redfern in his previous book, Randall would discover that much, if not all, of Judy's version of events simply didn't add up. According to Randall's research, Judy's husband had not died while serving in Vietnam, and perhaps more damaging, her own daughter offered to Randall that her mother often lied and made up stories regarding events in her life. 
In the age of the internet and instant access to information, debates still raged over just how credible the account of the Kingman UFO crash was, even if such accounts as those from Stancil and Judy went off the mark. Might it be that the basic notion of a downed UFO in the Arizona desert at some time in 1953 be more credible than most people thought? We might keep in mind that the alleged crash occurred in between particularly heavy UFO waves across the United States, in 1952 and 1954 respectively. So we know that whatever that might have been, there was a prolonged and persistent UFO presence over the United States during this time. Unfortunately, along with Judy Wolcott, Stansel has also since passed away in 2006. However, another person came forward with a story of their own. The Somewhere in the Skies podcast is free to listen to every week, but if you would like to help support the show, we have a very active Patreon page where you give what you think the show is worth. In return, you'll get early access to the main show, bonus episodes, and priority to ask our guests your listener questions. Your support truly makes the show continue and grow. So, to learn more and to join, visit patreon.com slash somewhere skies. In his book, Nick Redfern also highlights several developments regarding the Kingman crash. For example, another apparent whistleblower surfaced, one Bill Uhouse, who claimed to have worked on several top-secret government projects in Nevada decades prior. One of these locations, Uhouse claimed, was none other than Area 51. As well as possibly working with what he claimed was alien technology from downed vehicles, Uhouse also claimed that several alien entities, referred to as EBEs or extraterrestrial biological entities, were also housed at this top secret location. Even more remarkable, some of these aliens were alive. Perhaps of further interest was the assertion that the reason the public is kept in the dark regarding ETs and alien technology goes back to a deal organized by President Eisenhower. Uhouse would elaborate before his death in 2009 that a quote, peace pact of sorts was signed, something arranged between Eisenhower on behalf of the United States, the United Nations, and the extraterrestrial race concerned. Of course, this would resonate nicely with the assertions that Eisenhower had made a deal with an extraterrestrial race in February 1954, less than a year after the alleged Kingman crash, for advanced technology in return for a base to work out of in America, as well as access to the population for experimental purposes, essentially permission to abduct people. Perhaps of more interest, though, are the claims from U-House that one of those projects was the UFO that had crashed just outside of Kingman in 1953. And he would state, the same as Stancil, that four extraterrestrial occupants were recovered from the wreckage, one of whom initially survived but died a short time later. There was one other particular point of interest that U-House offered that could have been corroborated by the release of information that appeared online from an anonymous whistleblower who claimed he used to work for United States intelligence. Uhouse had offered that several of the recovery team at the Kingman incident had gone on to develop a multitude of health problems that appeared to have been from coming into contact with either the wrecked craft, the ETs, or both. According to what this anonymous source stated, the Kingman UFO crash was an actual event, and it was one that did indeed result in the recovery of four alien occupants. The alleged former intelligence officer, however, claimed that of the four, two of the ETs survived the crash. Perhaps the crucial detail, though, is the assertion that several of the recovery team went on to experience ill health, and this was due in fact to coming into close contact with the wreckage. As we can imagine, 
There have been several different reactions from inside the UFO community from this testimony. While some believe it offers further proof to the fact that an alien vessel did indeed come crashing on the ground, others believe it's merely another false statement with little evidence to back it up. While it is certainly possible that the anonymous intelligence officer is a credible source, after all, if one was to divulge such secrets, they would surely do so under anonymity, for obvious reasons. We can suspect that if someone was looking to manufacture such an account, they would not do so anonymously. What would be the point? On most occasions, those who submit false reports do so for attention or the possibility of monetary reward, something they could not get while remaining unknown. But there is of course a third possibility. The government or intelligence agencies purposefully planted this information into the UFO community as disinformation at its finest, a way of making the waters much murkier than they already are, and possibly to be able to dismiss other testimonies as false all that easier. We've seen this before in the UFO field many times where one truth is sandwiched between two lies. But the sandwich always spoils and is thrown out entirely. Let's stay with Redfern's summary of the case a little further, as he highlights the claims of one Marion Shaw in 2009, who came forward with apparent further corroborating testimony regarding the Kingman UFO crash. She claimed that she had worked as a secretary in the early 1950s at the Pentagon. She had worked her way up to working with high security documents. She claimed that she had once been asked to type a report on the apparent Kingman UFO crash, a lengthy document at that, and that this report mentioned the recovery of both the craft and extraterrestrials. She would elaborate that the report featured details of the craft and why it was thought to have crashed, as well as autopsies on the dead alien bodies. Despite these claims, there could indeed be a more rational explanation. Indeed, Nick Redfern summarized by offering such an explanation that the downed craft was in fact a QF-80 aircraft that was remotely piloted and featured a chimpanzee in the cockpit as part of the tests relating to the nuclear weapons at the time. Specifically, how the planes and pilots would fare if they had to fly into an atomic cloud. Is it possible that one of these planes could have crash landed in Kingman, Arizona? And if we assume the wings were lost, the fuselage, as Redfern points out, would appear very much like a cigar-shaped object. As for the apparent alien, it is perhaps reasonable to think, given this animal pilot was wearing basic pilot equipment, including a helmet, that these pilots, who would only have been seen fleetingly and from a distance, would mistake them for alien entities. Furthermore, if we assume these tests did involve the flying through atomic clouds, then that might explain why some of the recovery team felt unwell in the days that followed. In short, something did happen that day, but it was, as Stanzo claimed, an accident with a top-secret military aircraft involving tests the military, in the Cold War environment no less, wished to keep as close to the chest as possible. As we might imagine, many people maintain that Kingman has more to it than we currently recognize. With all of this in mind, just what should we make of the allegations that a UFO or a vehicle from another world piloted by extraterrestrial occupants crash landed in the desert of Arizona? As we've seen from Redfern's compelling argument, it does make sense. And given everything we know of the claims surrounding the apparent crash, this conclusion is arguably the most likely. But we can't fully discount the idea of alien craft crashing to the ground during the 1940s and 50s. Is it really that much of a stretch of the imagination? Especially when we consider the sheer wealth of claims that have come from whistleblowers albeit many of whom remain anonymous. 
not to mention possible crash retrieval programs throughout the years. And while we should, by their nature, treat these claims with just a pinch of salt, there are enough of them to continue to keep poking away at these claims. After all, if only one of them is even partially true, it changes things for all of us. And maybe it's possible that that one case happened in Kingman, Arizona in 1953. Here in an exclusive interview with the Disclosure Project, Bill Uhouse talks about working on re-engineered ET craft particularly the one that crashed in Kingman, Arizona. I've spent uh, 10 years in Marine Corps, four years working with the Air Force as a civilian, doing uh, experimental testing on aircraft. Since uh, my Marine Corps days, I was a, a pilot in the service and a fighter pilot and fought in uh, World War II after late, the latter part of World War II and uh, the Korean War conflict. After I got out of the Marine Corps, I. Uh, took a job with the Air Force at Wright-Patterson uh, doing experimental flight testing on various different modifications and tech orders that they had incorporated into aircraft, various different aircraft. F-89, uh, back then the uh, B-47, uh, F-102 and those aircraft. <clears throat> While I was at uh, Wright-Patterson, of course, I was approached by an individual that and I, I'm not going to mention his name, uh, to determine if I wanted to work in a, a, an area on just new creative things, okay? And apparently that was a, the flying disc simulator. What they had done, they had selected uh, several of us and they uh, reassigned me to a Link Aviation, which was a simulator manufacturer. Uh, at that time, they were building what they call the C-11B and F-102 simulator, B-47 simulator, and so forth. And they wanted us to get the experience before we actually uh, uh, started work on the flying disc simulator, which uh, I spent 30-some years working on. The simulator wasn't actually functional until around 1958, where uh, the simulator was actually operable. The simulator that they used, or the craft that they used to build, which is a 30 meter one, was the one that they crashed in uh, uh, Arizona, uh, uh, Kingman, Arizona, uh, back in 53 or 52. I think it was 53. That's the one they used. That's the first one that they took out to the test site. It was a controlled craft, you know, that the aliens wanted to present to uh, our government, or the USA. It landed about 15 miles from, uh, which used to be an Army Air Base, uh, which is now a defunct Army Base. I forget, the, I, rec I can't recall the name of it. But that particular craft, there were some problems with, number one, getting it on the flatbed to take it up to Area 51. They couldn't get it across uh, the dam because of the road. It had to be barged across the, you know, uh, the Colorado River at the time, and then taken up to uh, where people go now, up uh, up 93, out to Area 51, which was uh, uh, just being re really constructed at the time, and taken down those dirt roads and out out to that particular area of the test site. There were four aliens aboard that thing, and those aliens went to Los Alamos. It, it was a sort of a test thing. Uh, they set it. They set up the uh, Los Alamos with a particular area for those for those guys, and they put uh, certain people into there in there with them. Uh, people that uh, you know were astrophysicists, you know, uh, uh, just general scientists, you know, uh, to ask them questions. Uh, the, funny, the way the story was told to me was there was only one of them that would talk to any to to any of these scientists that they put in the lab with them only one of the aliens, the rest wouldn't talk to anybody or, you know, even have a conversation with them. You know, first they thought, you know, it was all, you know, ESP or, you know, te yeah, mental telepathy, but, you know, most of that's, most of that is kind of a joke to me because they actually speak uh, uh, 
maybe not like we do, but uh, they, they actually speak and can converse, you know. But there was only one. The difference between this aircraft and, and or this disc and other, other discs that they had looked at was that it was much simpler design. Uh, in the simulator, it was one, one big thing different. The thing that like Lazar calls the reactor, okay, we didn't have a react. We had a, we had a, a space in a thing that looked like the reactor, but that wasn't the thing we operated the simulator with. We operated with six large capacitors that were charged with uh, a million volts each, say there were six million volts in those capacitors, their largest capacitors ever built. Uh, these particular capacitors, they last for 30 minutes, so you could get in there and actually work the controls and do what you had to to uh, uh, get the aircraft or get the simulator, the, the disc to operate, okay? Actually, when it, when it was operable, it would lift off the ball about a certain amount of, of, of uh, there was a, a dimension there that we had that it actually lifted up and it could actually turn, you know, a certain certain amount of degrees left to right or whatever. But in a simulator now, uh, you'll notice that uh, there are no seat belts, right? And the same thing with the actual craft, no seat belts. You don't need seat belts. Because when you fly one of these things upside down, there's no upside down, like in a regular aircraft. You have your own gravitational field right inside. So if you're flying upside down, to you, you're right side up. There weren't any windows. The only place we had any uh, visibility at all, and it was done with, uh, <clears throat> with cameras or video type things at that time, was in the turret, in the turret section. My thing was the flight deck, yeah. and the instruments on the flight deck, I knew about the gravitational field and what it took to get people to, you know, train them to be able to come in that thing, you know, and, and and operate, you would be sick or disoriented in about two minutes after getting in after it was cranked up. After a while, after you get used to it and all and you and you do it, it's 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 simple. You just you gotta know where everything is, you know, and you gotta understand what's gonna happen to your body. It's no different than you know, accepting the G-forces, you know, when you're flying a, a aircraft or coming out of a dive, you know, and that kind of thing. It's a, it's a whole new ball game. Each engineer that had anything to do with the design was part of the startup crew. You know, verify all their stuff that they put in works like it's supposed to. So you really never knew how many we had. The last uh, 40 years or so, or 60 years, uh, maybe there's, uh, I'd say 40 years anyway, Man, not counting the simulators, I'm talking about actual craft, there's probably two or three dozen. There are certain reasons for the secrecy, I, I could understand that, no different than, uh, you know, the first atomic bomb that they built. Uh, but, uh, you know, they're getting so far ahead now with aircraft design and people have come up and they're visualizing and seeing some of the design aspects that are put in some of the aircraft today. And eventually, uh, I'm, I'm saying, most of this stuff will be out, out in everybody's plate to look at. Maybe not the way that everybody expects it, but in some manner they, they determine appropriate, you know, to show everybody, hey, look at what we got. This episode was researched and written by Marcus Loth. To learn more, visit ufoinsight.com. If you have a moment, please follow, subscribe, rate, and review Somewhere in the Skies on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. It helps us gain visibility and find new listeners. We're on Twitter at Somewhere Skies and Instagram at Somewhere Skies Pod. If you'd like to share your personal UFO story on the show, reach out to us on social media, or an email can be found in our link tree on social media. If you'd like to help support the show, we now offer all the same benefits as Patreon directly on Apple. 
Just go to the top of your Somewhere in the Skies Apple feed and become an Apple Premium subscriber today. Thank you so much for listening. And remember, keep the feet on the ground, but never stop searching Somewhere in the Skies. Somewhere in the Skies is produced by Third Kind Productions in association with the Entertainment One Podcast Network. Hey guys, Ryan here, and I've got some exciting news. We've recently partnered with Alien Coffee Bean to bring you the official Somewhere in the Skies coffee. That's right. What better way to listen to the show than with a delicious cup of Somewhere in the Skies? It's a perfect dark roast for those who love an earthly, full-bodied smoothness. These delicious beans come from the island of Sumatra in Indonesia. We've worked very closely with Alien Coffee Bean to make sure this roast was exactly what we wanted it to be. So I hope you enjoy, and I hope you'll pick up a bag of Summer in the Skies coffee today. Now available within the United States, with plans to go international in the very near future. Head on over to aliencoffeebean.com and use the promo code SOMEWHERESKIES10 to get 10% off your order. Again, that's aliencoffeebean.com. Remember, keep your feet on the ground, but never stop drinking somewhere in the skies.